these are the units that we used um, in these different time slices. Um, so here's the love logo. Okay, um, these are the different variables that we looked at. So um, we looked at what was the percent sudden illness in. So think about a brachypod. You are a brachypod. What do you care about? That's what we need to model. So, what, well, two things. What do you care about um, that we can see in the rock record? So you might have really cared about what the plankton looked like, but I just can't do that. <laughs> so, um, you know, so what's going on in oxidation, ichnophages, all the things that we can, me can measure that, in fact, um, matter to you as a brachypod. So here are what some of the environmental layers look like. So just to point out that each of them was distinct, each of them was different. So, um, and they all provide some sort of information to the analysis. Okay, so we looked at three different time slices. Um, because the mountains are eroding and the delta is prograding, the data is in a slightly different location um, for each of the three times. And so again, this is what one of these ranges would look like. This is a bivalve species. And this bivalve species is specific to shallow water near shore environments. Um, and you can see that, in fact, the range model that we've created here hugs basically the shallow water near shore environment. So we're seeing good correlation between the results and what we would expect from knowing about biophages and collecting these fossils for over 100 years. We can compare um, what we did with the polygons versus what we see now in the new ranges. Um, and so basically they're congruent with each other. The key thing to keep in mind is that um, the polygons are rotated in the paleogeography and these guys aren't, so kind of rotate them in your head. They basically occupy the same area. But using the advanced modeling system, we can do a couple of things. One thing we can do is expand ranges to areas that we couldn't see because there wasn't outcrop or just hadn't been sampled. The other thing we can do is find out, let's say, this guy here doesn't seem to live in the middle. When we connected the dots, we, we said, well, he must live there. Um, but actually, he doesn't have to. It looks like his environment didn't exist there. We can also look at how ranges change through time. So here's a productive brachypod species, and he had a small range going to a larger range. This is um, an ortho brachypod going from a large range to a small range. One thing that we can see if we look at this, every species that increases its range into the extinction, um, the crisis interval, survives the crisis interval. Every species that contracts its range going into the crisis interval actually becomes extinct. So um, something important going on. So let's do some stats. Um, it turns out that it really doesn't matter if you've got a large range any time before the crisis interval or if you have a large range overall. It's only during the crisis interval that having a large range helps you at all. So there's, it's basically this difference that you know you can understand between background um, events and what's going on during crises or mass extinctions. It matters only what you're doing at the time that the environmental crisis occurs. Okay, so if we tie these kinds of two analyses together, um, we can see species ranges are related to sea level, um, and that invasion events are also related to sea level. Um, and species that have large ranges that are invasive, or that are expanding their ranges during the crisis interval, are those that survive. Um, and so, and, and a key point here is that these species with invasion events are surviving. So at the end of the day, the invasive species comprise a high proportion of the fauna that survives compared to what we see um, of, the, of the original native species. So this all comes back to evolution. And so I want to talk a little bit about how we can tie this in with really what's going on in the history of our species. So to do that, um, I've done phylogenetic analyses. And you guys all, yes, phylogenetics, yes? Sort of? No? Um, OK. What we do here is this is just kind of a more modern um, and more objective way to do systematics than by putting things on a table and sorting them around by expert opinion. So what you do here is you look at the morphology or the features of organisms and you group them together. So if the ancestor, a shared ancestor of multiple species will have a specific characteristic, all of its descendants will share that. And so this is what we're trying to do. We're taking these shared characteristics and using those to derive the evolutionary history of a group. And so you draw it in a tree that looks like this. And each of these different branching events is related to a specific morphological feature. So we can do that. And once we've got that, we can then put it against a time scale 
and kind of look at how the species are alive through time. When, do e when does each species originate, and when do they go extinct, and, and how long was each alive? And if we do that, we can then calculate speciation rates. And if we calculate speciation rates and extinction rates, we do a couple things. First, we just calculate the rate of change through time, and then speciation, and then extinction. And so walking through time, again, our crisis interval is right about here, this last line. So what you see in this particular brachiopod is that it has a big decrease in diversity at this time, um, and there is high extinction. The extinction isn't any bigger than this extinction peak here, which was before the crisis interval. So it's really not extinction that's the problem. If you look up here at speciation, however, you can see there is none. Species are going extinct and no one is evolving to replace them. And that was different here at this earlier peak. Now that's one brachiopod genus. If you look at another brachiopod genus, we can basically see the same pattern. Diversity declines here, um, and it's really not due to extinction. Extinction isn't higher than it was earlier. Um, but difference during this interval is speciation. Now, if we're thinking about this, um, let's think about why speciation is stopping related to those biogeographic implications we started with. Well, um, we can take our evolutionary relationships and take the names of the species off and replace it with the regions the species lived in. So here we've gotten rid of our names, and now we're looking at a relationship of where species live. So this says the ancestor here lived in the Michigan Basin, but this descendant lived in the Michigan Basin plus Iowa Basin. So that means there was a range expansion. This guy was taking up more space than his ancestor. So if we map these three times, we can see episodes of dispersal. Um, those are the yellow diamonds, where you have a species in one region, but its ancestor lives in additional regions. Um, and this basically is similar um, to one of these invasions, but it, it's between ancestor descendant. The other thing we can see are vicariates. When you had a broadly distributed ancestor, this guy occupied three regions, and the descendant only lives in one or fewer. And so um, we can calculate the, the amount of dispersal versus vicariates, how species were forming in these plates. In this particular brachiopod, it's about 50-50 between dispersal and vicariates. If you look at our next brachiopod, you can see this guy is overwhelmingly speciating by dispersal. And again, each of these little branches is a speciation set. Um, if we look at our bivalve, um, six, it's 25% <coughs> Um, by carrying 75% dispersal. Again, dispersal is really dominant. If we move on to some very cool crustaceans, the phylocarids, uh, I did my masters on these guys, um, the same pattern, really lots of dispersal. And in fact, if we add this all up together, um, you can look at everybody's vicariates versus dispersal, and this gives us our overall value. Overall, across three different phyla, we've got 28% um, by carrying 72% dispersal. Okay, and that, uh, that's not really interesting on its own. It is interesting in some way. Um, by carrying is separating of ranges. If we're in the late Devonian, which is an invasive regime, species are moving around. And if all these species move around, then species can't, then populations cannot become separated. It basically, we're stopping speciation by vicariates. So we're shutting down one of the prominent, two prominent ways speciation occurs. So on its own, there's some compelling argument for this. However, if we compare this with the modern, if you look at how modern species have formed, 70% of these are by vicariates, only 30 by dispersal. This is the opposite of what we see in the Devonian. So this really adds a great um, amount of power to the argument that the reason that speciation is declining at this time is really that we're stopping speciation by vicariates, um, which is in fact the dominant mode of speciation. So we're stopping the main mode of speciation. The only mode we have is that of range expansion and dispersal, which is similar to an invasive species process. So again, all of these invasions are basically stopping our ability to form species at high rates and to form them by the, the most frequent mechanism that we see in the modern. And I just said all of this. Um, so. The overall role of invasive species, if we can kind of combine these three different um, areas of, of analysis together, is again, 
Species innovations are tied to all these transgressive events. That's what providing a mechanism for the species to move around. But once again, to the new basins, what they're doing is basically stopping new species from forming. Extinction isn't going crazy. Extinction is elevated, but not above background. The real difference is that speciation um, by vicarians is just stopped. 